robot firms, F-A-R-M-S, Foundation for Ancient Mormon Studies. They're a clearinghouse. They've been going for some years now. If there are any questions you want to ask about the gospel, you just call firms. They'll give you all the literature you want on the subject. That's what they're for. See? Somebody just called, uh, yeah, someone called last night and, and asked a question, which would give me a lot of trouble. So I just said, see farms about it. And uh, that's what you do. But it's about, uh, let me see this. Uh, yes, it had to do about, uh, about the problem of Jehovah. Is Jehovah God and this sort of thing? Boy, that's too full. Oops. And so all I did was just go to farms. They have more stuff on file than you can shake a stick at. Uh, but pass some of these around. You can, you can always get more of them. Let's just pass these around and keep them. And uh, <coughs> tell you what farms is. It's not, it's be a lot of questions. For example, if I ask you a, an essay question, all you have to do is go ask farms, and they'll supply you with all the information you need on it. <laughs> they really will. They've got everything. Good old farms. And uh, Steve Ricks is the new head of it, and he is one smart cookie. So, the phone hmm? it's, on, it's on this, yes. There's phone number, there's everything. It's down on 8th North and uh, Island University on the corner in the old Allen Hall there. Yes, uh, the old dorms. It's on the top floor in the corner there. And they have all this stuff on file, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of essays and books and everything else, anything you want to deal with these subjects. Now, the archaeological and... Uh, and the statistical and everything else. So you can find it quite useful to go to farms for information. Well, it's about time to begin now. Now we're on the 32nd chapter <coughs> of 2 Nephi. We're going to, to Jacob today. <coughs> and are things going downhill fast? Here's the first generation. They've already gone bad. And Nephi is just terribly depressed. He ends on a down note. And then Jacob, his brother, takes it up. And from then on, he makes a, makes a real plunge. Uh, <coughs> Yes, the 32nd here. Uh, <coughs> was here before last, asked for the final examination. If you were to be funded for the rest of your life and your life was to be extended for a thousand years with everything funded you need, what would you do? What would your plan of operation be? What, how would you spend a thousand years? You talk about eternity. If you don't, don't know what to do for the next thousand years, of course, they were just nonplussed. Nobody knew what they'd do, of course. So why do we need eternal life? We don't know what it is. This deals with that question. This chapter does. It's a very good one. It's an answer. Actually, the question is an academic one, as this will show here. No, he says, after you've done all the things you should do, he's telling us in the 32nd chapter here, and now behold, my beloved brethren, Ponder somewhat in your hearts. Now think this over, he says. Notice we don't ponder anymore. Pondering is against the rules. He ponder somewhat in your heart concerning what you do after. After you've got on the path of salvation <coughs> and all that, what do you do next? What are you going to do for a thousand years? <coughs> Some person said, well, I'd drive my Porsche. And uh, another said, well, I'd, uh, I'd live it up for the thousand years. <laughs> they said, couldn't think of anything to do. It was very interesting. But it's a very provocative question because you're going to be stuck with eternity whether you want it or not. You see, they cannot die, but the woman tells us and it's true. <laughs> Do not remember that I said unto you after you'd received the Holy Ghost. Well, for one thing, you could speak with the tongue of angels. Well, that means you're out of your present star. You're not going to be in your present league at all. When you start speaking with the tongue of angels, it's something else. It's like going to a new math. When you're in grade school, you say, well, of course, as we get more advanced in math, we'll just be adding bigger and bigger figures and subtracting and multiplying bigger and bigger figures. That's all math does. But then you suddenly discover there was a totally different kind of math you'd never heard of before. Well, you don't have big figures at all. You just have letters some of the time. And sometimes you have figures so small you can't even think of them. And so it goes. And then you go to another type. And it's the same thing here. When you start talking with the tongue of angels, you'll be in another league. And we'll talk about that when we get to it. It says, meanwhile, we've got to fulfill our our capacities here. So this is the answer, he says then. I say, feast upon the words of Christ. Behold, the words of Christ will tell you all the things that you should do. And that comes. You can't anticipate, as Paul says, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared. You can't even imagine it. There's nothing entered into your head. You can guess what it's like. The things that God has prepared for those who love him, for, who, are able, who are going to go on. So he says here, the words of Christ will tell you all things you have to do, but you can't anticipate until you get there, and we haven't got there at all. Notice it tells us also in the fifth verse, 
I say that if you will enter by the way and receive the Holy Ghost, you go about it the right way, it will show you all things what you should do. Then there won't be anything to worry about. And there's always more to come. But what's the trouble? Notice the fourth verse. Why is that a question like that a poser? Uh, we should ask this question, incidentally. He says, Wherefore, now after I've spoken these words, if you can't understand, it's because you don't ask, because you don't knock. Ask and it'll be open, but you have to ask first. Knock and uh, knock and it'll be open. Ask and you shall receive, and knock and it shall be open unto you. And, uh, but you have to make the first move, as Abraham did. And it tells us, of course, in the book of Abraham, thy servant has thought thee diligently, now he has found thee. You have to get off dead center, because that's, that's your responsibility here. That's why you're here now. And uh, then, enter by the right way. Receive, you've been given the commandments. You know what to do if you follow them, he says. And you receive the Holy Ghost. It will show you all things what you have to do. <coughs> but there's almost more to come. Notice he tells us in the next verse, in the sixth verse here, There'll be no more doctrine given until after the Lord comes. So there's enough for you to live by now. They're living, living by the law of Moses. Uh, but when you speak with the tongue of angels, you will no longer be limited by the ambience in which we find ourselves. I say, we'll, we'll go on to a higher math now. And of course, we should ask questions, and that's one thing we don't do. We see we teach people, don't ask questions, don't rock the boat, and so forth the questions we should ask. And when he shall manifest, then ye shall observe. The next step, he says, when he comes, he will manifest you, and then you shall observe the things he, he gives you to do then. And you'll cross that bridge when you get to it. Uh, and uh, then we come here. Now, but what's wrong? Notice the seventh verse here. Now, I Nephi, I cannot say more. The Spirit stoppeth my utterance. I'm left to mourn. He says, people can't take any more than this. Not only be wasting my time, but I'd be putting them in jeopardy. I'm left to mourn because of the unbelief and the wickedness and the ignorance and the stiff nakedness of men. This is wisdom literature. Nephi is distressed, you see. For they will not search knowledge when, nor understand great knowledge when it's given to them in plainness, even as plain as it can be. This is all very true, you know, the interesting, the most difficult, the most sophisticated, the most difficult scientific problems are really elementary. It's their simplicity that's, that stops people cold. It's always something extremely simple and naive that gets the Nobel Prize, you know. It's a surprising thing. And once it's given, everybody says, well, we knew that all along. Oh, no, you didn't. <laughs> you know the story of Columbus and the egg, don't you? Everybody knows, knows the story of Columbus and the egg. Well, Columbus was at a dinner after, after he got back. They were giving a dinner in his honor. And uh, they said, well, any, anybody could have done that. All they had to do was just go sailing and so forth. We, we had plenty of reason for needing that. That was quite possible. No problem at all. So he says, can any of you make an egg stand on end? And they passed around, they all tried it. No, they, nobody could make an egg. Stand. Columbus took the egg and he gave it a slight tap at the end, and then it stood on its end. He said, oh, yes, anybody can do that. Ah, yeah, he says, anybody can do that after he'd been shown what to do. <laughs> the same way with discovering America. Anybody can do it once it's been done. And uh, so it's the same thing. They won't search knowledge. Of great knowledge when it's given them the plainest it can possibly be. And it grieveth me. And we. We blame God for this. Maybe I should ask some questions here. Let's do this. Here's a question. How would you answer this question? In uh, my day, which was many years ago, it was very popular for everybody to be atheists and so forth. It was considered very smart, H.L. Uh, Mencken and so forth. And this is the foundation. This is the foundation of, of atheism. It's this argument. Uh, it's only reasonable to judge the character of God by the type of world he created. Well, that's fair enough, you see. And so we have this nature, red in tooth and claw. What kind of a God would do that? Uh, thou who didst man of baser metal make, and who with Eden didst create the snakes, he man made us bad and weak. For all the ill with which the face of man is blackened, man's forgiveness give and take. And, and will thou with predestined, no. Oh, th <coughs> let me see. Well, oh, thou who didst with pitfall and with gin beset the way I was to wander in, Wilt thou then with predestination round and mesh me and impute my fault or sin? He said, God put all these stumbling blocks and, and uh, temptations in my way. And when I tripped up, he said, ha, you sinned. You see, just like that. He set the trap. Then he said, I sinned. This, these arguments were considered unanswerable, and they are without the gospel, of course. One of uh, Tom Ingersoll's famous arguments, he was a famous atheist, you know, was uh, why does God permit it to rain on the ocean? Just waste all that good water. See, would God do that? Is he wise God? In fact, they had in ancient times, they had a type of, of, of ode, a poem, uh, 
uh, in his famous ode on the Mem Samoira, Horace has a famous ode on that particular subject, called the Mem Samoira. The Mem Samoira is a point in which you, in which you fall, find all the faults you possibly can with this world and say, who is responsible for this mess and that you are? And you can take it in, in a cynical, uh, smart aleck way, like Woody Allen, and say, well, God is just an underachiever. That's all. The least thing you can say about it, he's not bad, and so forth. And so we get the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, and, and Hamlet talks about it, everybody talks about it. But when I was on a mission in Germany, it was less than 10 years after World War I, and it was in a dismal, I started out in a dismal manufacturing town where a year before they'd had the worst explosion in history, it wiped out the town. It was a terrible thing, because that was where they made all the powder during World War I. They were secretly making it already. Uh, less than 10 years after World War I, against all the laws, and then they had a terrible explosion and wiped everything out. Well, everybody, was, everybody, all, every door you went to, everyone had just one answer. He can go, there is no God. He would never allow these things to happen. I stayed with a lady call, in a room with an old woman called Mrs. Bauer, and she said, no, there can be no God. She had a boy 17 years old, and he went to war and was killed. Would God permit that to happen? No, I'm boo. She says, how, how can that happen? <laughs> Anybody have an answer to that? All Europe was disillusioned, you see. And they still are disillusioned. Now, in the Second World War, where I was more active, hundreds and hundreds of prisoners of war coming in. You, find, you pick them up with all their stuff on them. They come in and gladly surrender. You see, they come right in the field there. That's where you're supposed to catch them, and they'll tell you anything. Uh, but you know, in the First World War, they all carried Bibles with them. The Kaiser handed out Bibles to everybody, and a tract called Talks with Jesus and so forth. He was a very religious man, and everybody on both sides were quite religious. But in the second one, nary a Bible. All sorts of charms and rabbit's feet. Well, Spostak was the charms. Lucky charms, uh, rabbit's feet. All, they had those by the hundreds. Once in a while, you might find a Bible, say, from some, some peasant kid. But that was it. I mean. They, nobody took Bibles anymore. They, they took lucky <laughs> charms and things like that. Well, what about this? God would never allow things to happen. Well, but the Bible, we're being told here, and the Bible tells us what kind of a world it is. Do we, do we need to be told? Think of some of the passages there. From there, you see, this world is the place of evil it's supposed to be. But without the gospel, there's no answer now. See, it's not God who's being tested here. It's men who are being tested here. That's the, the kind of world it is. And men alone make it a cruel world. They invent the work ethic and the law of wage, iron law of wages and things like that to oppress their fellow men. That's all they're doing. And, and life is unfair. They say that's the proper answer if you say, well, of course, when you've uh, robbed somebody, you say, well, that's true. You've got a dirty deal. But then life is unfair. And you're supposed to take that as a proper answer, you know. Or they can quote Ecclesiastes. But here, we just read in, in Nephi 9.18, he says, those who have endured the crosses of the world and despised the shame of it. This is a place of crosses and of the shame of the world. It's a place. They shall inherit the kingdom of God, which was prepared for them from the foundation of the world, the joy shall be full. And here are no illusions. The world is a shameful place. It, it's to be despised. It's a rotten world. So you say, why go on living then? This is the question. Well, why do you go on living? You should ask somebody that. Well, for the best possible reasons, for eternal life. This is the big chance. You're, you're really getting a, a chance here for atonement. See, this is atonement, getting, getting back to the one again. God has lengthened the days of our probation. Don't throw away this precious gift. And of course, it's got to be a rough test. The tougher, the better, as far as that goes. We have nothing to live for down here. We have everything to live for. All our hopes, everything is centered here, because here is the trial, as Paul says, and there is the crown, you see. You, you fight the good fight, you run the good race, and look what he'd been through. He talks about his stripes, his imprisonments. That's what his life, his life was hell here. You know? And then if there is no resurrection from the dead, we are of all men most miserable. We've been the biggest suckers in the world, he says, if there isn't. But he went through all that, but everybody has to get a dir have dirty deals anyway, so why not, to, why not make the best of it, he says. If there is no resurrection, we are of all men most miserable. But as it is, he says, I know there's a crown laid up for me. I know there's the real world is thereafter. This is not the real world. This is a fake. Everybody knows it's a fraud. I mean, it's as phony as it can be. It's getting that way all the time. We're living in a TV world now where <laughs> everything is, is imaginable and make-believe. So we get this very strong in, this, in, in Nephi on this downbeat here. He's distressed, you see, and feeling the same way about it. And then he tells you what to do. And he says, the spirit and I, they will not search knowledge. Now, what are you supposed to do? Well, this is the answer that Freud, it grieveth me that I must speak concerning this. But if you would hark to the spirit, it teaches a man to pray. 
And you know that you must pray. Now, there's nothing more destructive, as you know, than a mental block, of any, a block of any kind in which you grind to a halt. Caused by drugs, it's, it's guilt feelings that cause those mental blocks, and that's what keeps you from praying. It's a block that's just like the heavens are brass, you see. And uh, this is a, as Freud, good old Freud has shown us, all these mental blocks come from feelings, conscious or unconscious, subconscious feelings of guilt. Your sin is catching up with you. You feel unworthy to pray. Satan doesn't want you to pray. Pray, and it mounts up. The more you need it, the more inclined you are not to do it, not to suffer it. For a moment, he says, you. If you would hearken to the Spirit, but you're not doing it, you say, it would teach you, a man, to pray. You would know that you must pray. For the evil spirit, see, there is that evil spirit in you, and the guilt that's in you. Uh, that says, don't pray. Uh, it's not only embarrassing, it's humiliating as far as that goes, because in prayer, of course, you, you face reality, because you're alone. I mean, the, uh, you're not going to pull anything over on the Lord. You know that you must pray, for the evil spirit teaches the man not to pray, but teaches him that he must not pray, actually. So there's nothing more destructive than these mental blocks because of the guilt that's in us. And by praying, this frees us up. This frees the mind, you see. This thaws it out. He uses this word hardened a lot pretty soon. Uh, uh, Jacob does. Uh, but this causes a thaw and causes things to flow again when you want to start praying, maybe, maybe with a flow of tears as far as that goes. And, and in public prayer, of course, in, in, in congregational prayer, we concentrate our minds so on a single object. See, we're all thinking together. There. That's a concentration. It's a very important thing, you see. But in private prayer, when you're alone, you see, that... That frees the mind. That lets you go, you see. You're, you're not putting anything over on the Lord. So he said, you must pray always, he says, and, and not faint. And you must not perform anything unto the Lord, save in the first place you shall pray unto the Father in the name of Christ, that he consecrate thy performance unto thee. Thy performance may be for the welfare of thy soul. This is the optimum, optimum voice, you see. Uh, if... Uh, so, if you don't do these things, what do you do, of course? If you're not interested in what you can do, well, there are comfortable cliches and platitudes and routine sermons and superficial research, we can have those things. So in the next chapter, he says, now, I speak like I am mighty, he says, neither, I'm not a mighty in writing, uh, uh, like unto speaking. For man speaks by the power, uh, should we have speech writers? It should be if we really claim to be inspired. And so Brigham Young never wrote a note, nothing. He was all strictly from the cuff. He just, just swung from the shoulder and he, he delivered, though he'd only had 11 days of school, he delivered in this marvelous, vigorous, forthright, direct, powerful prose, a, a great master of prose style. And he, he never took a note or anticipated what he was going to say. And now, they cast many things away that are written. See, people aren't going to take them seriously. These things are written, but people don't really pay much attention to them. We, we, we go through, we're not very careful about it. But he says, I've written, I think it's very important. Whatever. You might not think it's important. Notice the third verse. He says, I don't, you might not think it's important, but I have written what I've written, and I esteem it of great worth. And mine eyes water my pillow at night because of them. Nobody, these idiots, they won't pay any attention at all. And you can't sleep. The man, poor man, is sick about it. See, he's, this is his farewell, and it's not a happy one. The words which I have written in weakness will be made strong unto them. You'll see. Notice say, he lists five things that his writings, in the fourth verse here, fourth and fifth verse, five things he wishes to achieve in his writing. For it persuadeth them to do good. It maketh, mon, maketh known unto them of their fathers. It speaketh of Jesus, it persuadeth them to believe in him and to endure to the end, which is life eternal. That's what we're on, want. You, see, you wouldn't have anything to endure at all if this was the kind of world people wanted God to make it, the perfect world, the thing that upset St. Augustine so much. And in speaking harshly against sin, according to the plainness of truth, wherefore no man can be angry with these words. It's, it's against sin, he says. And then he ends on a charitable note. He's going, he wants to end on an upbeat here, but he's having an awful hard time doing it. Or he says in the seventh verse here, I have charity for my people and great faith in Christ that I shall meet many souls spotless at the judgment seat. Secondly, I have charity for the Jew because I am a Jew too. I mean from whence I came. Thirdly, I have charity for the Gentiles. But for none of these can I hope except they're reconciled to Christ. They have to enter the narrow way and the straight path 
and endure until the end. And this is one of the objections they always used to make. It, it's always so narrow-minded, so mean thing. Why is it it's so narrow? Why do so few get through the door? Why is it so limited and so forth? Well, to be on target, here in, here in this world, we're on a vast, wide, almost endless plain. We can wander anywhere you want here, and we're prone to wander and go into all sorts of things. And with this field to wander in, we can show whether we have the sense to go in the right direction. You will choose what your heart desires when, you're, when it's left entirely up to you, you see. You will gravitate in the direction which you really want to go. It will expose you as you really are. And so, here we are, and he says, you must keep the straight and narrow. You must go that way. That's the way. This is will answer all your questions, you see. Of course, it's a terrible when we tell you that all the time. And you can get out of it going straight ahead. Keep in mind, as Mosiah says, we haven't come to Mosiah yet, so we won't quote that, will we? That's illegal. Well, but he says, I shall stand face to face before his bar. And literally, I think that's true. I have reason for believing that's literally so. I speak the voice of crying one from the dust, farewell until that great day shall come. And you that will not partake of the goodness of God, he ends on a negative note after all, and respect the words of the Jews, the scriptures, see, and respect the words of the Jews, and also my words, and the words which shall proceed out of the mouth of the Lamb of God, I bid you an everlasting farewell. See, these words are all fused, joined into one. An everlasting farewell. For I seal on earth, shall be brought, what I seal on earth shall be brought against you at that judgment bar. Thus hath the Lord commanded me, and I must obey. Can you imagine a more, a sadder ending than that? Thus hath the Lord, he didn't want, he wanted to be happy about it. He was of a cheerful disposition, terribly optimistic, as you know, he was always dragging the family through a dirty situations. But here he says, the Lord hath commanded me, and I must obey. Amen. Now his brother, Jacob takes on at this point and then proceeds to take a real plunge. He goes down. Jacob has not great, very much hope for what's going on here. This, this is very sad here. Now Nephi gave me, Jacob, a commandment concerning the small plates. And this is an important point here, you see. He commanded over the second verse. He commanded that I should write a few things which I considered to be most precious and touch just lightly on historical things. So the Book of Mormon is not a history. And don't expect the book then to explain the new world of the, in ancient times. That's not its purpose. Uh, it's no handbook of archaeology. You can find a lot reading between the lines, an immense lot when we get the battles and the migrations and things like that. Meanwhile, this is what you look for. He says, we're just supposed to write these things. The history's in other books, which, we, which are to be had, but not at this time. If there were, this is what he's supposed to put in, he says. This is a tractate. He's not going to write a history, but a tractate, he says, the fourth verse. If there were preaching or revelation or prophesying, I should engrave the heads, just the principal topics. Heads is the right word, the raphim, you see, the, the kephalia. That means the, the chapter, the main head, the main points. In, in Hebrew, Greek, all the other languages, the word for that was head. He's the same word, the heads. The principal, the principal themes of them, of preaching, revelation, prophecy, just the, mo just the most important thing. For Christ's sake and for the sake of our people. And because of faith and great anxiety, says, it truly has been made manifest unto us concerning our people what things should happen to them. So it's, it's prophetic too, but he is full of anxiety. We also had many revelations in the spirit of much prophecy. The, the uh, authors are also directed and we labor with our people to persuade them to come unto Christ. This is his writing, you see, it's, it's protectic, it's a swazoria. Uh, that's a type of writing that's devoted to persuading somebody to do something. Protectic is to join somebody, it's a swazoria is to change your way of life, your behavior, and so forth. It's an appeal, and that's what Jacob is here. As in our same situation as that as the children of Israel in the wilderness, we're always that way too, notice. As in the provocation in the days of temptation while the children of Israel were in the wilderness. It's admonitory, it's warning, and we're still in the wilderness as far as that. We're not out of the woods, so to speak, you see. Wherefore, we would to God that we could persuade all men not to rebel against God. That's the least you can ask for. That's the dominant theory. So why so negative? <coughs> that all men would believe in Christ and view his death and suffer his cross and bear the shame of the world. There it is, you see. You say this is a lousy world, well, somebody beat you to that. You didn't discover that. They regarded it as something rather brilliant to discover that the world which God created was, was not perfect world. So they said, ha-ha, there's no God after all. And everybody was talking that up, as I say in, in my day when I was a kid. The, uh, 
his cross and bear the shame of the world. That's what we're supposed to do. Not very, is this what we're here for? The suffering and shame? Hmm. Well, look around you. You have a marvelous chance <laughs> for going through that program, and I can't think of any other you're going to have to go through. It's rather bad, isn't it? We're going to have, it's going to be how we take it. And you can have, it, have nothing but fun, as, uh, as Mosiah says, I was going to quote, you see. Always remember, I would that you should cook him in remembrance, always, the greatness and goodness of God and your own nothingness. If you do this, you will always feel to rejoice. Now, I'm willing, I'm gladly willing to accept my nothingness. That helps a great deal, you know. And uh, as for rejoicing, I find it's rather fun. I find it's rather pleasant to rejoice. So I rather like rejoicing. So think of yourself as nothing, and you will. You'll, you'll have no problems then, will you? you and I, <laughs> that son I was talking about was in the San Francisco Ballet. He, he is now managing a huge enterprise in, in Guam, a Japanese uh, consortium hotels and things. And he's all of a sudden, in the last, <laughs> he's the top dog there. And he says, it is hell. He never wanted to do that. He wanted to be on the stage sort of thing. But he says 85% of the trouble he has at managing is just smoothing out troubles between people, feuds, and lies, and plots, and jealousies, everybody's doing. He said, when things go smoothly, just 70% of the time is, is uh, spent taking care of those things. But the rest of the time, that's all management is. And uh, in fact, I have a, my daughter and son-in-law going to China next week for a one-week trip to China. They have a very interesting project there. Uh, they suggested it to Harvard, and within two days, it was not only approved, but funded. So they're going. Uh, to Peking for just two uh, for just a week, and they're going to come back here again. The project is neat; it's set up beautifully. Uh, there's a Chinese, uh, a um, mainland Chinese, who is a member of the church, and he runs this large factory there. And he's divided the workforce into three equal parts: one is directed by a Japanese, one by a Maoist Chinese, and one by a Hong Kong Chinese. They're totally different philosophies, totally different approaches. How do they work? How does the management work? How do they compare? Well. John has, uh, has done a great deal of work on that. That's his thesis was, was uh, management in Japan, what they have there, and so he was just the man for the job. But that whole problem is that people ha are making a hell of them for themselves wherever you go. All these feudings and fights that go on in the office, no matter what office you go to, you're going to find the trouble. Church office right near there. I mentioned that before. Well, it's not as bad as something. The place where you find at least as far, maybe I'm stone blind, but uh, you say stone blind? I guess so. <laughs> deaf, you're stone deaf, aren't you? But uh, maybe I'm blind, but the place I found this least of all is the BYU. I found, I found no feuding at all here. Maybe I'm just just absolutely dense and don't notice it, or something like that. Maybe going on all the time, so, but at a place like Berkeley or Claremont or Scripps uh, College or Pomona College, those little colleges and so forth, ooh, the nasty sniping. It, it's uh, like a novel by Agatha Christie. You go to the innocent little village, and this is where you find the hatreds and the boiling <coughs> revenge and all these plots and plans going. What a world we live in. Well, this, I'm a Samoyra myself now, am I not? Well, and so we must bear the crosses and shame, and uh, you, you'll have fun while you're here, and, uh, and much better things after. Now Nephi, he says, he anointed a man to be king and ruler over them. They wanted a monarchy, and the people loved Nephi exceedingly. He was their great protector, their defense, and their welfare. That's what the king's supposed to do, to provide victory and prosperity, and Nephi did that, you see, to every king. Wherefore, the people were desired to retain in remembrance his name, so they started choosing kings, and, and his brother was not his successor. He, uh, Jacob was not the next king. The next king bore the name a second Nephi, and then third Nephi, and so the same thing with Caesar. See, Julius Caesar founded the empire, and uh, he didn't find, yes, he did, but, but everything, everyone after him was a Caesar, including the Kaiser of Germany and the Tsar of Russia. Those are just the words Caesar. The name of one man, his, his personal name becomes, uh, becomes a title, and, and the same thing with uh, uh, in, in ancient Libya, it was the Batis and Arkesilus, they became kings. And also it runs in royal families to preserve certain names as great favorites, as if a king is very popular. So for hundreds of years it's very easy to remember the kings of Denmark because it's always Christian, Frederick, Christian, Frederick, Christian, Frederick, Christian, Frederick, Christian, Frederick, that just goes on and on, there's nobody else. Uh, that helps. Who is king then? It was either ki Christian or Frederick, you say, and you're safe. You see. <laughs> the, uh, so you had a second Nephi and a third Nephi, and that was the custom anciently, of course. And uh, 
Now, notice the difference between Lamanites and Nephites is a purely political one. Purely political. Notice here these 13th, 14th verses. There were not Lamanites. The people who were not Lamanites were Nephites. Nevertheless, they were called Nephites. This is what they really were. Notice the seven tribes. <coughs> There's been some anciently, the, the pattern of seven tribes is a very well established one. I think you'll find it in Zombart and others where they talk about the seven tribes. Uh, why they are, you can see various things, seven planets, things like that, various connections. But anciently, uh, the, the established pattern was seven tribes. Here they had seven tribes really within the Nephites. They were called Nephites, Jacobites, Josephites, Zoramites, Lamanites, Lemuelites, and they kept some of their ethnic marks, I suppose, but this is a very complicated racial picture, see. But who you call the who got called a Nephite or a Lamanite depend entirely on his politics. Now he says, and those who are friendly to Nephi I shall call Nephites, or the people of Nephi reign in his stead, you see. And uh, that's what they were. I, Jacob, shall not hereafter distinguish them by these names. I shall call them Lamanites that seek to destroy the people of Nephi, whose policy was anti-Nephite. They were Lamanites, and there were plenty of Nephites of Nephite blood among them, but they were the same family after all. What do you mean, Nephite blood? They were brothers. And uh, plenty of uh, who will seek to destroy the people of Nephi and vice versa. Those who are friendly to Nephi are Nephites. And it's a complicated picture from here on. Policy. Already in the reign of the second Nephi, people began to grow hard in their hearts. Well, according to the first Nephi, they were hard in their hearts already. But here he says they began to, be grow, to grow hard in their hearts. Now see what the situation is. Here we have people rattling around like peas in a bag. We have histories of people that uh, went into vast empty spaces, but it wasn't necessarily empty. There, there are continual hints of the former inhabitants of the land and so forth and other people around. But as Jacob told us, I told my brother told me, pay no attention to that sort of thing. That's not the history we're interested in, he says. In the same way, I'm not interested in political history. I'm just going to gonna group them all under two names and let it go with that, Nephite and Lamanite, not, not making any distinction. And it's in the same way here. He doesn't go into any of the political complications or any of the, the military or the wandering, but these, he closes his book in a very, uh, in a very uh, eloquent statement, uh, and thus, a lonely and a solemn people, we did mourn out our days. So they're a lonesome, he says, a lonesome and a solemn people. And there, of course, there have been plenty of lonesome and solemn peoples in the past in the, being discovered. This was uh, what, uh, not Nathan the Babylonian, but uh, Hadani, Eldad Hadani, Eldad the, the Danite, a Jew of the ninth century, traveled all over looking for lost colonies of Jews. And in Asia and Africa, he would find lost, lost colonies and wandering and so forth. You do find them. Remember, it's only today that the earth is so jam-packed full of people. Back in those days, there was plenty of room to move around, and you didn't, you weren't running into people everywhere you went. Uh, and so, we're just imagining the community living very much to itself. And as I said, is it boring to live by yourself? Well, it's the big city where you really get bored, isn't it? Or people get bored to distraction. So you can be happy wherever you are. But these people were having a hard time, but ah, they discovered gold and silver, and they went crazy. They had a gold rush here. Also, they began to search up much gold and silver and to be lifted up in some pride. Oh, yes, he begins that. Uh, to grow hard in their hearts and indulge themselves in what, well, we know about pioneer communities. Uh, say in Australia and so forth, the first settlers. Uh, well, what do we think of a frontier community? A rough, primitive frontier, and, and the regular fixture in the saloon uh, were the ladies of the evening, and uh, the morals were very loose. And this is part of the frontier picture, you know. Everybody kicking the gong around and, and wild, and the life is cheap, and uh, the liquor flows, and no great moral moral strictures or, or standards here. And so he says, they're already designing many wives and concubines. They're, they feel like kids out of school, I suppose. They can do anything they want now. And he says, and, and they also began to search much gold and silver and be lifted somewhat in pride. Wherefore I, Jacob, gave unto them these words I taught them in the temple, having first obtained my errand from the Lord. Now I, Jacob, and my brother Joseph had been consecrated priests and teachers, so they weren't to be the kings. Second Nephi was a king, but, but they were priests and teachers and been consecrated by their, by their brother Nephi of this people, by the hand of Nephi. And we magnified our office of the Lord, taking upon us the responsibility, that's what the priest had to do, you see, if the, if the, unless he could rid himself of the blood on their garments, we're getting back to the atonement rites of ancient Israel, you see. 
uh, taking upon them the responsibility, answering the sins of the people upon their own heads. If we did not teach them the word of God with all diligence, it would be on our heads. Their blood would come upon our garments and we would not be found spotless at the last day on the great day of Yom Kippur when everybody's garments must turn white. So these are teaching as a right, the right, in terms of the right of the atonement, which is familiar with these people. And he talks about it in the next chapter, right at the beginning here, and he says, I began to magnify my office with soberness that I might rid my garments of your sins. I come up to the temple. Well, in the temple, I say on Yom Kippur, that's what the priest did. You had to rid your garments. And I am weighed down now here. He's been feeling terrible, he says. I have hitherto been diligent in my office and calling, but this day I am weighed down with much more desire and anxiety. Things are getting worse than they have been, with much more desire and anxiety. For behold, you have been obedient, but your thoughts are beginning to labor in sin, and this causes me to shrink with shame, what I have to say, he says in the sixth verse. And use so much boldness before your wives and your children, many of whose feelings are exceedingly tender and chaste and delicate before God. The word we'd use is sensitive today. Sensitive wasn't used in Joseph Smith's today. Today you'd say delicate. See, they're very sensitive to these things. And they have come to hear the pleasing word of God, which healeth the consolatio, a consolation. They want to be cheered up. And they, the women, we, we find out pretty soon, they, worked, they were overworked. They were practically captives. So they were under the strain where their husbands gallivanted around, collecting the gold and so forth. And uh, the children suffered accordingly. And they came to the temple to hear the consoling word of God and to be, con and to be healed. And what have they got to hear? He says, they've got to hear this talk. And it's terrible. He says, makes me ashamed of myself. I have received, but I have received from God as a command, a strict commandment. He says, I'm talking, this is not my idea. Uh, this means that things are very bad. There's more than mere folly that's going on here. The a strict commandment to admonish you according to your crimes. And he doesn't call them sins and follies. He says your crimes to enlarge the wounds of those who are already wounded instead of consoling and healing their wounds, to pierce their souls and wound their delicate minds, their sensitive minds. Well, he says, I must do it according to the strict commands of God, so I must tell you what God commands me to tell you. I have no choice, he says, because I am under the glance of the piercing eye of Almighty God. I can't get away with it. I must carry this out. This is like pulling teeth. He hates it. Boy, does he hate it, but he has to go through with it here. So he goes on. I must declare the word now, my brethren, the 12th verse. Uh, he starts out with the number one sin in the Book of Mormon. Now behold, my brethren, this is the word which I declare unto you. You want it? This is what it was. That many of you have begun to search for gold. There's been a gold rush. Uh, and <laughs> in which the land of promise is about, they found rich, rich mineral finds, and when that goes there, the, the community goes mad, and that's what's happened here. And the hand of province has smiled incidentally twice yesterday. I came across that expression. I hadn't seen it for a long time. The hand of province has smiled. The hand of providence is used quite often as a smile. This mixing of metaphors is very interesting. Do you know the word hand occurs over 1,600 times in the Bible? 1,600 times the word hand, used in every possible connection. It was the hand. It means the power, the authority, or the way a thing is done, and so forth. I think it's the most used word in the Bible, probably. I've checked all the others. Well, anyway, <coughs> this is the word. <coughs> the hand of providence has smiled on you, and some of you most pleasantly, and you've obtained many riches, some of you more abundantly than others, and... Uh, so you become pride with stiff necks, high heads because of the costliness of your apparel, and persecute your brethren because you think you are better than they are. Now this is a strange thing. God doesn't justify that. He condemns you. He can pierce you. He would rid you of this iniquity and abomination. Think of yourselves. Uh, this is a uh, <coughs> perfect motor here. I had some marks here, but well, here we go. Anyway, <coughs> think of your brethren like unto yourselves. Be familiar and free with all your substance, that they may be rich like unto you. See, to be rich is all right. Well, we can be all rich together. But the rich do not like that, you see. I have a quotation from Hobbes. I'm going to read it to you here. This is relevant. Uh, R.L. Heilbrunn is perhaps the most eminent uh, economic historian writing today. And this is what he saith about what he said in 1976 about our business civilization. He said, no other civilization has permitted the calculus of self-interest so to dominate its culture. It has transmogrified greed and philistinism into social virtues. 
and subordinated all values to commercial values. Thus, the business civilization combines liberty and selfishness, egalitarianism and extremes of, rich, of wealth and poverty, vulgarity and democracy, creativity and waste, respect for the unique and autonomous individual and wage slavery, the conquest of space and the destruction of the environment. So what the Book of Mormon says here is relevant to our condition, according to Brother Heilbrunner. Uh, Oh, H-E-I-L-B-R-O. You know, Heilbronn is a, the town just up the river from, where the river turns up the river from Heidelberg. You should have known that. <coughs> it's a beautiful little place. And uh, it's R.L. Heilbronner in an interesting book published in New York in 1967 by Norton. He, he talks about it a lot there. But anyway, he goes on here. But before you seek for riches, now this is a favorite passage. A lot of nations love this because they, this gives you a hand. This gives you, makes you, frees you up to, to seek for riches all you want to. Before you seek for riches, seek for the kingdom of God. Well, I've gone on a mission that takes care of that. Now I can seek for riches. No, I've heard that plenty of times. Idealistic at first, but not after. And after you obtain a hope in Christ, you shall obtain riches if you seek them. You're not supposed to seek them, but if you insist on doing it, and if you do, all right, you can seek them under one condition, he says, for the intent to do good, to clothe the naked and feed the hungry, liberate the captive, administer the relief to the sick and the afflicted. That's the justification. Is this the prophet motive, you see? Uh, either stop with verses 13 to 16 or do it this way. Uh, the others are unacceptable. But he says, if you must seek, this is the way you do it, you see. And then... Uh, it's, it's a very interesting thing here. Uh, I say this is a favorite. Notice he says, it shall be with the intent. Well, the person says, yes, I intend when I get my second million to do that. But uh, uh, who was it the other day who's uh, talking to a doctor whose brother is fabulously rich and he had just asked him, see, he was it was in here, and he asked him, uh, when do you think you'll have enough? Do you think you have it? No, never, never, never have enough. He says, you, the more I get, the more I want. I have to have more. Someday I'll start doing good with it, but I must get more. And this is the way it was going, you see. So with the intent to do good, I like that passage. I'll seek rich with the, I intend to do good with it. So that's all right, see. Uh, maybe I won't live that long, but I have a good intention here as far as this goes. That is a favorite. It's okay. Uh, and it's like raising money for charity. The, uh, there, a recent thing came out in, in the Wall Street Journal that showed uh, those who contribute to the poor over 90% are middle and lower middle class incomes. They're the ones that contribute. The rich contribute nothing at all. Once in a while, there'll be a library or a gymnasium. There's a monument to his name, you see. If I've made a lot of dough and uh, the time comes for me to cash in, I can't take it with me. Is my life wasted? No, not if it will be remembered forever in the John Doe Library, you see, as far as that goes. And so that's the only gift you're going to get out of them. But uh, this article is a very interesting one, incidentally. It, it's surprising, you see, how very little the rich do give to the poor. Well, that's why they're rich, after all. Uh, so we go on here. Well, here we have Nibley Park in, in uh, Salt Lake, Golf Links, because my grandfather liked to play golf. We have Nibley Park in Glendale, which my father gave to the city. What, we, all the oak trees have died there, because they're withered by, by f smog, being Southern California. But uh, they rob with one hand and <laughs> give with the other because they didn't, there are plenty of sharp deals, believe me. Well, anyway, this is talking about those people, so I'm justified in talking about them. They become proud in your hearts of the things that God has given you. Isn't it a funny thing that uh, uh, people get proud of, the, uh, of getting gold? It's a surprising thing. Why is finding metal something to make you proud or something to make you rich? It's not useful for many things. Gold is used industrially, and silver is used in, in a number of things, but they're not the most, by any means as valuable, say, as copper, aluminum, things like that. And uh, why this thing? Well, it's a very interesting thing with gold, as you know, throughout the world at all times. And as you know, nowhere did they load it on and regard it as more sacred than in, in middle America, these people in, in ancient America. The Indians of all the Americas regarded gold as sacred, but the great Pinder, the greatest of all lyric poets, was Pinder, and his first and greatest ode, the Olympic Ode, begins. He's going to, he asks himself, what, with what shall I compare the Olympic Games, uh, the Corinthian Games, or uh, the Isthmian Games, and uh, which were the best? Then he compares all the best things in the world, and his opening lines are, Ariston Menidor, Hodechrysos Aithamanon Pyr. The best thing on earth is water, he says, but 
Gold is a, gla is a glowing, flashing fire to which all hearts turn, you see. It's gold which is irresistible, item and unpur, a spiritual quality, a shining, glorious, golden, the mere color of gold itself. And of course, that's the word glory and gold uh, connect very closely. The GL sound means to, gle to glitter, to gleam, to glow, to glisten, all those GL words, and that's where the word glory is. And uh, we, uh, we uh, the uh, the golden uh, the golden city and the gold Jerusalem the golden see they're sacred no matter whether you're religious or whether you're anything else the savages love gold more than anything else you can see why not just because it's enduring the most enduring it won't react to anything it's the most enduring and the best plates you can get are gold plates but the uh, but it has this fascination it's it's what golden and glorious and we I say we we associated with heaven the, the glory throne and and the, the, the golden cities and the, the well, the golden gates and things like that, and uh, the golden rule. Gold is our thing, so if you get a lot of gold, you're, you're really in there. You can't do anything with it, but uh, you have it, and that's great, you see. Now he says, the, oh, then he goes on here. Why do you do that? Don't you think, speaking of this greed and sin, proud in your heart because of the things God has given you, uh, and incidentally, he gave them this advice, if you seek wealth, you should do it for this purpose. Does anybody in the Book of Mormon seek it for that purpose at all? Amulek, a very good man and so forth, didn't, not, not for a minute and so forth, this goes. Did anybody take this advice? They did not. I see all these chapters I marked down, passages in the Book of Mormon where the people couldn't do it. They immediately turned to the other way. They would hang on so long. Do you not suppose that such things are abominable unto him who created all flesh? Uh, he hasn't mentioned chastity yet. He's going to get to that now. And the one thing is as precious in the sight of the other, the one, all flesh. And the one being is as precious in his sight. This is impossible for us to get through our heads. It's hard to take that any other person is just as important to God as you are. And that's one of the hardest things in the world to swallow, especially when you have an authoritarian structure. It's harder to swallow, isn't it? Keep his commandments and glorify him to ever. To glorify him is to share in his glory. Remember? The first chapter, 19th verse of the book of Moses. Right? This is my work and my glory, to bring to pass the eternal life in him, to get us in it with him. See, that's the atonement, to bring us back to him. That is his work and his glory and what he gives to others. And his son glories with him the same way. So you are able to glorify him forever. How can you glorify God? By doing what he tells you and sharing the glory with him. He wants you there. Now I must speak turning a grosser crime. Gross is a good word because it is gross. You see, he's talking about sex here. Uh, they seek to excuse themselves in committing whoredoms because of, of David and Solomon. The scripture give people excuses for all sorts of things, you see. And these are the two most legendary characters, not only in, in religious history, but in history at all. David is the great romantic hero of legend, is David. And uh, Solomon, of course, the most voluptuous and the most luxurious and the most luxurious of all rulers. They built him up to be that. So we get Solomon the voluptuary and David the romantic. And it's in that sense in which they were taken by the Jews, uh, rather than in their priestly and uh, sacred con. Because remember, Solomon went astray. He got off the track. And he was biting in the same way. David, the best David could say is, thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, because David, David did things he shouldn't do. Remember the story of Bathsheba, David and Bathsheba? what he did and to Uriah, the, to the soldier, the Hittite soldier, and killed him so he could marry his wife. Well, that was David's doing. So don't try to justify yourself by David and Solomon, he says. David and Solomon had truly many wives and concubines, which is a bundle. He doesn't like the concubine system at all. Now he says, I haven't led you out of Jerusalem to go on with that same sort of thing. That I will not tolerate it here, he says. In those 25th verse, I have led this people forth out of the land of Jerusalem by the power of mine arm, that I might raise up unto me a righteous branch of the fruit of the loins of Joseph. I took you away from all that, and I will not suffer that this people shall do like unto them of old. You're not going to get back on the track. This is one of the blessings of the promised land, you see, what's going to happen. Now these whoredoms and abominations you talk about, or the Lord will curse the land. The promised land will be cursed for your sakes. Immorality cancels all promises here. Then he goes on. Notice the 30, the male chauvinism, the mourning of the daughters of Israel because of the wickedness and abomination of their husbands. The 33rd verse, they shall not leave away captives, the daughters of my people. They're virtually prisoners, you see. They, they have a, a very, very uh, so, uh, male-oriented chauvinistic society. 
men are uh, practically prisoners. The women are practically prisoners as far as that concerns. They have to do all the cooking. They have to set up the teepee and everything else. They shall not commit whoredoms like unto them of old. Custom will not make it mandatory. And there are places where custom, people say it's always a custom, so we do it. Well, like, like Fasnacht and up and down the whole length of the Rhine, you see, uh, during that one night, uh, you can do anything you want. And that's Fasnacht. You dress up and disguise yourself so you won't be responsible, you won't be recognized the next day as far as that goes. But it goes back to Roman times, so they say, well, that's what we've always done. It goes back to primitive times and they do it. It's a, it's a wild time. Yes, a glooming peace this morning with it brings. The sun for sorrow will not show his hand. Go hence and sh had more talk of these sad things. Some shall be pardoned and some punished. That's a verse I like and it's very appropriate this morning so I can use it. Uh, you have done greater iniquities than the Lamanites. You have broken the hearts of your tender wives and lost the confidence of your children. They've wrecked the family, you see, by your bad examples before them. And because of this, the strictness of the word of God, which cometh down against you, many hearts died pierced by deep wounds. Notice this, the word of God had specifically forbidden it, and because of that, it was even more painful on the women and the children, because the gospel had always taught them you shouldn't do those things. You see. The disruption of LDS families is doubly tragic, and it does happen too, you see, because he says, because of the strictness of the word of God, which comes down against you, many hearts died pierced by deep wounds, knowing, knowing these lusts, the, the word of God is strict and breaking it uh, compounds the disaster as far as that goes. Well, the time is up now, but uh, are we going to get anything cheerful out of Jacob? We shall see what we have to expect here. But uh, I wish it wasn't so close to home. It's beginning to make me uncomfortable. I think it's time we change to the Doctrine and Covenants, isn't it? So we can feel better. <laughs>